Hey Church, it's so good to have you join us online. If you're watching from one of our watch parties or our locations, welcome. And if you're joining us for the first time, double welcome to you. It's so good to have you here. If you're here in Victoria, I am sure you're enjoying some of our beautiful, wonderful newfound freedoms. It's been so amazing just to be out and about again and seeing so many of your lovely faces at last. Well, we're going to dive right into the Word of God today. But before we do that, why don't we pray? Father, I thank you so much for your incredible word. I thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place, Lord, where two or three are gathered, Lord, you are in our midst. And so, Lord God, we just give you thanks, Father, that we can gather under the name of Jesus. And right now, Lord, I just pray for open hearts, Lord God, for every person as they leaning into you, Lord God, that you would speak to them, Lord God. Father, that this word would be transformational, Lord God, in hearts and lives today. Lord, we bless you. Father, we expect to receive from you and we thank you for it now in Jesus' wonderful full name. And if you agree, why don't you say it? Amen. Amen. Well, lately, as I've been reading my Bible, I've been finding myself hanging out a bit more in some of the shorter books in the New Testament. You know, Romans, Ephesians, 1st, 2nd, Timothy and the rest. It's been a really great exercise just to read and reread one book in the Bible a few times over before moving on to another. When you just take some time to ponder and really think about the words and what's written there. It's amazing how much God will speak to you. There's such great instructions for both our walk with God and just our everyday life. You know, this week I was doing this with the book of Timothy, the first book of Timothy. You know, first and second Timothy are letters written by the apostle Paul to his son in the faith, Timothy, and are filled with lots of honest talk. I love honest talk. And I just love how Paul writes. He states at the outset of his letter to Timothy what his heart and his purpose is in his writing. He says these words in 1 Timothy 1 verse 5. He says, The purpose of my instruction is that all believers will be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience and genuine faith. Filled with love. That seriously is what we want to be, isn't it? So Paul makes that clear that he just wants God's church and his people to flourish. And so he writes to us bringing instruction and if need be correction on our walk in Christ and life in general so that we'll be able to do just that, so that we'll be able to flourish. And then as you read through the book of 1 Timothy, you see him addressing a number of behaviours and thinking that had begun to infiltrate the church at that time. It had begun to infiltrate and warp the perspective of some, causing divisions and dangerous kind of exclusive hierarchies that were never instigated by God. And as I read about this, it reminds me somewhat of our current time where people are writing and posting. Sometimes they're speaking and they're shouting about what the church is and what it isn't, what it should, what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing, trying to sway people into fulfilling their needs and their agendas. You know, it's so true what it says in Ecclesiastes chapter one. It says, there's nothing new under the sun. People were doing it then and they're doing it now. So as I read through the book of First Timothy, I'm really connecting with it. In it, we get to read Paul's thoughts on these things that are happening and his instructions to Timothy, his wise counsel really, on how to deal with some of the issues that he's facing. And then what we get to is we get in the middle of all of this, we read this line and this is the thing that really caught my attention when I was reading this this week. In chapter 6, verse 11, there's this line and it says this. So first of all, he's been talking about all the things that has been going on and how to deal with them. And then you, then you hit this line and he says, but you, Timothy, are a man of God. You, Timothy, are a man of God. So run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life along with faith, love, with perseverance and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you which you have declared so well before many witnesses. What a great grounding statement. What an amazing statement for Paul to say right there to to Timothy. And it begins with these words, but you, but you, Timothy, are a man of God. This is such a clear eyed, powerful reminder from the apostle Paul to his son in the faith. In the midst of all the stuff, all the facts and data, all the stuff that's going on, he shot an arrow of truth. He's making a declaration of what Timothy is and how he sees him. He doesn't just see him as Timmy, my mate. You know what I mean. 
Timo, my, my, my wingman, Tim, oh Tim, or Tim was my assistant, you know, or my little bro, or even the son who just has to do what he's told. But he says, he says that he sees him as Timothy, a man of God. I love this because he's confirming and endorsing him afresh to the whole church with this letter. But also he's speaking right into his soul. He's speaking to, into his insecurities, into his weariness, into those internal and maybe external voices that are saying anything other than this. Those voices that are less than encouraging or faith-filled. Paul's stating and reminding him that he's not just a godly young man, but he's a person of character with purpose and calling on his life who carries a godly authority and has an identity that is founded in Christ. He is a man of God. And Paul knew he was. You see, Timothy had po- travelled with, apostle, with, the, with the Apostle Paul for many, many years. And recently, Paul had put him in charge of the church at Ephesus. Like this was a big deal. It was a large church in a major city. It was a big deal and it had a lot and there was a lot to deal with. It had challenges. Everything from people doing the right thing with the right motives to doing the right thing with the wrong motives to doing the wrong thing with the right motives. And then people just doing the wrong thing with the wrong motives. As I said, it was a lot to deal with and Paul knew it. And so in the midst of this moment and in the midst of this time, he spoke. He shot that arrow of truth. But you, Timothy, in the midst of all of this, remember, you are a man of God. You know, anyone, anyone listening, anyone watching, you've had a lot to deal with lately. It could be the loss of a job. It could be change of employment. It could be health issues or loved ones with health issues or emotional issues or stresses in your business or relationship strains or fears or, or a million other things. Or maybe your world hasn't had dramatic challenges through this time, but it's just been that constant pivoting and changing that's affected us all and how we have to live our life in this season. It's got wearing on you. We've all felt it. It can almost be enough to make you forget who you are and what you're here for. Oh man of God, oh woman of God. In fact, this letter being written to Timothy could just as well have been written to you or me. It's a letter of encouragement and wisdom in the midst of things being just a little bit big and a little bit crazy. It's a letter of instruction to help remind us of who we are and what we're here for, to remind you that there's a call of God on your life. Because Timothy was a man just like us. And guess what? He still had his own insecurities and fears and worries and and weariness to deal with. We can see this in the things throughout the letter that Paul speaks into and encourages him about but still he presses on to live a life worthy of his calling. I wonder what sort of person or personality Timothy was. Do you ever think about that? You think about the people that you're reading and what they're, who they were and what they were like. You know, when we read Paul's letters, I mean, Paul just sounds like such a go-getter. You know, very different, very different, say, from me. Like I, I, I would listen to him and I, I think he's amazing, but he's so different from me. But as I read this letter to Timothy, I kind of get the impression from the wording that Timothy may not have been like that himself. He didn't necessarily run to take up his call or run to take up the responsibility and the challenges connected to it. He was happy in the background. He was happy serving somebody else. We see it in what Paul says in 1 Timothy 1 verse 3 when he says this. He says, when I left for Macedonia, I urged you to stay there in Ephesus and to stop those whose teaching is contrary to the truth. We may not think of it at first glance, but this word urged is a strong word. I urged you. And pretty much every translation I looked at used this word. The word urge means to push, to force, to compel, to insist or to persuade, which makes me think Timothy may not have been pushing for it himself because Paul didn't just ask Timothy, oh, Timothy, Do you want to do this? Would you like to do it? He wasn't asking him if he felt like he was ready. He didn't ask him if he was interested in stepping into this great opportunity. He had to urge him, compel and press him to stay in Ephesus and to lead the church after he, Paul, was going to be leaving and moving on. I mean, wow, why did he do this? I mean, surely God doesn't press us to do anything that he doesn't want us to do, does he? Well, I don't know about that. But what I see here is Paul one of God's apostles, urging and pressing Timothy 
to step out and to take up this responsibility. And it's written here in the Word of God, documented for us all to see. So why do you think Paul did this, do you think? And also, why did Timothy let him do this? After all, it sounds to me like Timothy would have much rather, much preferred to have remained in the comfortable place under his mentor's wing. And who can blame him? After all, he was Paul's right-hand man. Even with the hardships they endured as they traveled together, at least he could lean into Paul. It was comfortable. It was familiar. He felt safe there. You know, it's interesting, isn't it, how we can even get comfortable in our discomfort. Even in places that are hard, we can get comfortable there. Because traveling with Paul really meant persecution and trials. It wasn't, what, uh, it wasn't what we would call a comfortable place, but he was comfortable in it and he didn't really want to leave it and step out and step up. And anyone else ever been a little like that? Maybe when you're thinking right now of stepping up and stepping out back into the fullness of normal life, you're not alone, nor are you the first one to feel this way. But I will let me encourage you, we can't let these feelings guide us. They're really just the pre-match nerves or jitters that the enemy loves to ride on the back of to keep your life small. Because if you know anything about God, and I know, I know this about Him, where He's taking you is always better than wherever you've been. And Paul knew this too. See, that's why he urged Timothy to step out. In numerous places throughout Scripture, Paul takes, uh, talks about Timothy being his son in the faith. And the truth was he loved him too much to let him sit there. He knew this young man. He knew his heart. He knew his spirit. And that later he would regret what he hadn't done. So Paul did what he needed to do. He urged him on. Paul was also able to look at things with the eyes of the Holy Spirit, unhindered by Timothy's feelings or his fears. And he knew that Timothy could do this. In fact, this would actually become the making of him as a man. You know, just like any personal trainer or any coach, when they ask you to give what you don't feel that you have, anyone else ever felt like that? Anyone else ever had that experience? And they're saying, just two more, just 10 more, you can do it. You know what? Paul was prompted by the Holy Spirit. He could see the bigger picture, the gift within Timothy and the call of God on his life. So he challenged him to rise to it. Can't you almost hear Paul reminding Timothy of the eternal perspective and all the Christ had done for him and his family and in his life and of the great commission that they were a part of, that we are all a part of. I'm sure he would have been thinking of the need of the people of this world to be saved and the people of his church that need to be built and strengthened. The need for him, Timothy, to play his part. And it's still the same for us today. See, the reason Paul urged him was because he loved the church and he saw the need of God's people for a leader, a preacher, a pastor, an evangelist. You know, interestingly enough, when you read the first and second Timothy, you, you, see God, you see Paul prompting Timothy to do the work of an evangelist, which makes me think he wasn't actually an evangelist. He wasn't necessarily doing all the things, you know, gifted in all these things, but God's people needed it. And so he was being stirred up to rise up. Isn't it the truth? It's never just about us. It's never just about us. There are multitudes on the other side of our obedience. And I believe Timothy knew these things too, at least some of them. And deep within him, when Paul was speaking to him, he knew that it was God speaking to him, which is why he let Paul urge him to stay, to step into the larger life. He trusted God and he trusted the man that God had put over him. I want to I want to just stir you today and remind you today, this is such an important thing for us to remind ourselves of right now. When we might be encountering that conflict, you know the conflict? The spirit is willing, but oh my goodness, the flesh is weak and not match fit yet. Still all the more, O oh man of God, O oh, woman of God, as you listen to this, God needs us to remember who we are and to walk in it. He needs you to see the lost and be moved with compassion to reach them. He still needs you to be active and a present part of the body of Christ here on earth. He still needs you to worship Him and use your gifts that He's given you to love, to encourage and to build one another up in the most holy faith. 
He still needs you to keep unity of the faith. And all of this, all the more as we see the day of his returning, drawing closer. This call that's upon each of our lives has always been there. The cause of Jesus Christ isn't subject to circumstances. I love the fact that it's been, I mean, seriously, it's been such a blessing to see how throughout this lockdown season, we have still seen people giving their lives to Christ, still getting water baptized, still being baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's online, that's not necessarily in person. Still reaching out to their friends with the love of God, still giving generously, still serving the house, still living big. How do they do it? Because the call and the cause are still the same now as they were then. Because directly after the words, but you are a man of God, are these words. In 1 Timothy 6 verse 11 to 12, it says, so run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness and a God and a godly life, along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the true, for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many witnesses. Here we're encouraged, run from evil. You know, there's always opportunities to do wrong, especially in this season when not all the rules seem to make sense. I've got to admit, sometimes I have thought that not all the rules make sense. But let's not be those who turn, let's, let's instead be those who turn away from temptation and run from evil. You also, we're also encouraged to pursue righteousness, to pursue faith and love and perseverance and gentleness and live a godly life. Again, I encourage you to make the most of every opportunity to live this upright life well. Understand that the rules and the laws, they're there to stop wrongdoing. But within those rules, there can often be many hidden opportunities to do good, many opportunities to be a blessing, many opportunities to be kind, to be generous, to be gentle and to be godly. Let's pursue those things. Be like a detective and look for them until you find them. I sometimes think about that parable of the, you know, the pearl of great price. This incredibly valuable thing was found in the middle of an empty field. I think to myself, who would find a pearl like that in the middle of an empty field? I think whoever found it decided to go looking for it. And we're also encouraged to fight the good fight of faith. Yes, it'll take some effort on our behalf, but we're called to it. So some things will need to be cut off and other things will be strengthened in our lives, but that's what will allow us to live this life of faith and live it well. And finally, hold tightly to eternal life. This implies that if we don't, we may actually lose what we currently have in our hand. I don't know about you, but sometimes that's a really good thing to remember, to not take for granted the things that God has given to us, this eternal life that God has given to us through Jesus Christ. Let's keep that perspective alive in our daily lives. Let's not be those who are careless with the precious gift of eternal life that God has given to us. It, after all, it cost him everything. It cost God the life of his only son, Jesus, that we might receive it. We know what it says in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We each have but one life. And I've got to tell you, it's way shorter than you think it is. I remember when I was young, I used to think it was forever, that we would live forever. But the further you go along, the more you realize it's only a short life. So let's not get distracted and waste our strength on passing things that only cause divisions amongst us. And life gets complicated all too easy as it is. And I know that there can be legitimacy in many of these complications. We acknowledge all of that. But also there's an exception to these circumstances. It's attached to the person who is you. See, that's why this line starts with, but you. It's an acknowledgement of all the circumstances, but then it comes in with, but you, oh man, oh woman of God. So when these things threaten to define you and direct your life, remember, but you. You're in the middle of the battlefield and the battle's not yet won, but you are more than a conqueror and you have victory in Christ Jesus. We are in the world, but you are not of the world. Life's giving you lemons right now, 
but you are going to believe God to turn it around, just as His Word says, turn all things around for the good of those who love Him. And you're going to turn those lemons into lemonade. Your employment door just closed, but you know that it was always God who's been your provider and He's not stopped by that situation. Your loved one's health is under attack, but you are calling to the one who listens and who is well able to heal. I declare it over you now. You, but you are a man, but you are a woman of God. So with this in mind, can I urge you to arise? Can I urge you to lift your eyes to the field that is ready for harvest, for the life that's that's still had left to live? then let's go do something. Amen. Let's go do something for Jesus. Can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? You know what? Maybe you're in this place and you're, you're listening and you're, you're receiving this word and you're like, something's, God's began to stir something within your heart about, but, but me, I'm, I'm a man or a woman of God. I want to pray for you because you know what? Fear just wants to come and stop you. Circumstances want to come and stop you. Insecurities want to come and stop you. But I want to tell you that those things don't stand against God's word. God says to you, but you are a man of God, but you are a woman of God. And therefore, through all circumstances, through all situations, God has got your back. God is going to bring you through. Let me pray for you now. Father God, I thank you so much for every man, woman, young and old, Lord God, listening to your word today. Lord, I thank you so much for what, Lord, for the fact that your word does not change, Lord, it remains the same. And you speak to us and say, but you are a man and a woman of God. No matter what the circumstances right now, Lord God, every person leaning in, every person listening, Lord God, they are your son, they are your daughter, they are, they carry godly authority, Lord God. They have, they have character in Christ, Lord God. They have an identity that's founded in Christ. So Lord God, I just break off fear. I speak against fear. I break it off now in Jesus' name. I break off insecurities that would threaten, Lord, their identity in Christ, Lord God. Father, instead may faith arise, Lord God. May may their identity in Christ, Lord God, once again be reestablished in their hearts and in their lives, Lord God, in their thinking. Lord, may they see themselves as they truly are, as your word says they are, that they are a man and a woman of God. Lord God, I just speak blessing over them, Lord God. Father, when circumstances come, Lord God, may your peace arise within their heart, Lord God. And Father, may it overcome all things. May they continue to move forward. May they continue to rise up and grab a hold of all the life that you have for them. Lord God, I thank you, Father, that circumstances cannot stand before them when they stand on your word. Father, when they hold true to you, Lord God, when they when they call out to you, you are the God who hears. You are the God who answers. And so, Lord God, I thank you for these men and women of God, young and old, Lord God, that they are going to step into the fullness of a great new season as they're stepping into this time ahead. Lord God, bless them, I pray. Father God, provide for them, bless them, bless their families, their marriages, their businesses, their homes, Lord God. Bless their studies, Lord God, if they're at school, Lord God, that they might know the fullness of your goodness in this land of the living. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. 